The journalists that investigated this problem revealed about 12 million documents showing some of the most richest and most prominent figures in politics, entertainment, and leadership hiding their money in offshore accounts located in islands in the middle of several oceans, like primarily just all of the oceans. And to be fair, the journalists did question the oceans about this as well, right? Did they know about the tax scam? But, you know, the oceans didn't really know a whole lot and they got really confused about what the concept of money was. And then the oceans just kept pointing out how it's like a tool that's mostly being used to destroy like everything and everyone we all love. And then it had a lot of questions about how crypto works. So the, the, the journalists are no longer going to be talking to the oceans uh, like ever. There's there's going to be no journalist that will ever interview an ocean ever again. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. Uh, before we get into this episode, I want to tell you guys about some really awesome virtual shows coming up and really awesome live in-person shows coming up as well. Uh, if you enjoy these podcast episodes, if you enjoy the Fork Full of Noodles, I write, produce, and record them on the last Thursday of each and every month. The last Thursday of each and every month, it's a whole new show, and you can be in the virtual audience via Zoom every single month. Tickets are available for these shows right now. I'm also producing virtual stand-up comedy shows where I work on new material, tell stories from the road, tell stories from my life that'll eventually become material that you'll see me perform live on in-person shows. So if you want to come kind of see the process and enjoy uh, a more casual, laid-back stand-up comedy show uh, via Zoom o o over o on a in a virtual setting, you can be anywhere in the world for these, these virtual shows. Uh, come check those shows out. Uh, those ticket links are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I'm also going to be on the road with Ron Placone for a week and a half, two weeks, uh, somewhere around there in April, from April 16th through the 25th. On the road with Ron Placone, we're coming to Pittsburgh, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Burlington, Portland, Maine, Boston, Massachusetts, and New York City. So if you're in those cities or in cities surrounding those areas, please do come hang out with us. Grab your tickets. Again, you can go directly to my website, which is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Dot com. I hope to see some of you guys there. Uh, and while you're on my website, you can check out my stand-up comedy albums, most of which are available to download for free. Uh, you can also make donations, one-time donations, or become sustaining members. If you make monthly contributions, uh, you get a ton of bonus stuff, which includes uh, free tickets to both in-person shows and virtual shows as well plus bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling content and a bunch of other really cool surprises. Uh, so check that out, uh, and you can also sign up for my email list. And that's important because I'm pulling back from how much I'm posting on social media. Uh, I, I started just kind of automatically doing that, and that has been a great help to my mental health and has helped me focus more on my writing, has helped me focus more on uh, rebuilding my personal relationships and improving not just my mental health, but also my physical health as well, because I can concentrate a little bit more on that. So the email list is a really, really great way to keep up to date on what I'm doing. Email me back about you know what what you think about a particular piece or so on and so forth. So I hope you do that again. Go to my website krishmohanhaha.com. It's k r i s h m o h a n h a h a dot com. 
Thank you guys so much. And now on to the episode. So the biggest open secret in America is how massive the wealth gap between the richest few and the working class majority is. Right? Workers in America are treated pretty terribly on a regular basis. Classism in America is determined by the job you have. And think about it, right? We don't really treat the fast food worker or the retail employee with the same level of respect as someone in IT or civil engineering or pornography. These people get far more respect. But most interactions between a customer and a fast food worker ends in a screaming match with a Karen yelling, how hard is it to make a fucking hamburger? Listen, Karen, if it was that easy, why don't you jump back here and work the grill, huh? Meanwhile, our highways are crumbling, bridges are falling apart, and no one is looking at these civil engineers screaming, how hard is it to maintain a growing economy's infrastructure? <laughs> anger. The anger is very misdirected at the working class and the most financially vulnerable. But what can you really expect from a country that you know, has the collective maturity of a teenager. The real question should be, why the hell is the infrastructure crumbling? And why are workers dealing with all of these societal issues? And the answer comes from the existence of people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Billionaires have been preventing progress from occurring in our societies, you know, way back when they were just sweet, Sweet little millionaires, just those sweet millionaires. So since since 1978, the wealth of billionaires have increased over 1300 percent, while average worker pay has only gone up 18 percent. As of today, a CEO makes over 350 times that of the lowest paid employee. Now, capitalists say that this is a reflection of the, quote, market for skills or talent, right? They're claiming that the high pay of a CEO is because of the demand and skill it takes to be a CEO. Now, I didn't realize that staring at a half glass of whiskey in front of a fire pretending to contemplate something deep was that difficult of a job. I mean, really, if there was a larger call for hiring CEOs, then we'd see a lot more CEOs getting hired, right? But every time I pass a target with a now hiring sign, it doesn't say that they're looking for a CEO. Look, I get it. The job of a CEO might be difficult, but it's is it really quantifiably 350 times more difficult than someone who's putting their physical body on the line for the sake of profits? I would very confidently wager to say, uh, fucking no, I don't think that's how much it is. Right During the pandemic, billionaires like Jeff Bezos uh, you know, grew their wealth by 19%. This is their personal wealth, not just their business wealth. And someone like Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, Washington Post, and the owner of a very nice lava side property at the darkest, deepest depths of hell, is currently on his way to become a trillionaire now. Elon Musk has so much money that less than 1% of his wealth can eradicate world hunger by ensuring everyone at least one meal per day, which would mean that less than 3% of his wealth everybody on the planet could get like three meals a day. But as they say, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? If Elon took that minuscule amount of wealth to feed everyone, then we'd likely have to say, thank you, Mr. Musk, may we have some more? As he sits on his throne made of a Tesla flamethrower and a Tesla rocket, smoking weed with his financial advisor and czar of bros, Joe Rogan. But... We're taught that if you have that much wealth, you earned it by working hard and staying true to yourself and your cause. And this is a myth. If we really lived in a meritocracy, the single mom working three jobs to ensure a good life for her kids would be close to becoming a trillionaire instead of a balding demon that took a joyride to the stratosphere so he can send the most expensive dick pic to the entire planet. 
Look, Jeff Bezos didn't create Amazon in a garage with nothing but the grit of his shoes and the twinkle in his eye. This is how Jeff Bezos actually got his money. Because it wasn't the novelty of Amazon alone that catapulted it to the center of the internet, so much as the absurd head start that an initial $300,000 investment that Jeff's parents gave him. Elon Musk didn't create Tesla with nothing but the sweat on his brow and the rainbows in his heart. This is how Elon Musk made his money. And although Musk likes to play up his version of the everyman story too, his family is most infamously known for his father's ownership of a lucrative emerald mine and role as a property developer in apartheid South Africa. These people didn't start from nothing. It wasn't just hard work. Billionaires never get there alone. They get there in any combination of three ways. One, family wealth and privilege. Two, labor exploitation. And three, government help. Look, the only bootstraps both of these men, and I'm, I'm using that term very loosely in this context, the only bootstraps both these men have are the ones they stole from the working class. They start their business with low interest loans or inheritance from very old money acquired through slavery, but to maintain a steady growth to infinite wealth and cash, they've utilized other methods of exploitation. Wage theft is a big way these corporations steal money directly from the workers. Very simply, wage theft is when you don't get paid even though you're supposed to. Whether it's because you worked overtime but it wasn't counted, had your tips withheld or not compensated for on a slow day, were misclassified as an independent contractor, were refused benefits as an employee, or just straight up didn't get your check, there are at least a dozen different ways your boss can steal the money that you're entitled to so that he can eat it. I mean, I assume that's what they do with it, right? They, they eat it. They're obviously not spending it, so they must be doing something. Anyway, the sad reality is that this happens to millions of American workers every year. While the individual amounts are pretty small if you take them week by week, added up, they get into the billions of dollars. At the low end, estimates that only include minimum wage violations total around $15 billion a year stolen from American workers. $15 billion. Already $2 billion more than the number we get from all those other forms of theft. At the high end, estimates that count several different forms of wage theft more than triple that number. And you end up with a whopping $50 billion price tag per year in America and thousands out of the average worker's hands. That's really bad. By a lot. But it's only the tip of a much bigger iceberg. And in most cases, fighting this problem legally is almost impossible. And in some of these, in some of these low wages, workers are undocumented immigrants that get threatened by deportation. And remember, uh, exploitative capitalists are touted as the best and the brightest in our society, despite being the opposite of that. It's impossible to get that rich by legal means. The only way you get that rich is by committing the largest and most elaborate highway robbery that mankind has ever seen. Over the last few years, we've had a large number of documents surface that show us how the enormously wealthy hide their money from the rest of the world using tax havens. The most recent of these revelations are from the Pandora Papers. The journalists that investigated this problem revealed about 12 million documents showing some of the most richest and most prominent figures in politics, entertainment, and leadership hiding their money in offshore accounts located in islands in the middle of several oceans, like primarily just all of the oceans. And to be fair, the journalists did question the oceans about this as well, right? Did they know about the tax scam? But you know, the oceans didn't really know a whole lot, and they got really confused about what the concept of money was and then the oceans just kept pointing out how it's like a tool that's mostly being used to destroy like everything and everyone we all love. And then it had a lot of questions about how crypto works. So the, the, the journalists are no longer going to be talking to the oceans uh, like ever. There's there's going to be no journalist that will ever interview an ocean ever again. Now, look, 12 million do documents is like a lot of paper. Right. So these journalists had to make a choice on the names they revealed to the public. And in order to get the attention of the general public, it has to be like a really sexy financial scandal, which 
uh, I know, it sounds like I'm calling the color beige exciting, but this is the age we live in, right? F financial crimes happen and they're not as riveting as a Law and Order episode, but they are immensely catastrophic despite their very boring nature. And we all really, really have to start paying attention to this. Now, the Pandora Papers exposed the King of Jordan, the presidents of Ukraine, Kenya, Ecuador, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, U.S. officials, celebrities like Shakira. It turns out her hips did lie. They lied like a lot about taxes, but like significantly about taxes. Right. Even sports stars like Cricket's Sachin Tendulkar from India are hiding large swaths of their wealth in tax free offshore accounts. This shadow economy, as it's called, shows how trillions of dollars are unaccounted for in the world's economy. The United States is the second largest tax haven in the world, only behind the Caribbean islands. And this is why the U.S. is trying to be so friendly to the rich, right? The states can't be number two in anything, let alone rich people. You know, the, the, the United States anthem is, we're number one. We're number one. I mean, I hear that more than I hear the Star Spangled Banner, right? And right now, there are only two states in America that operate as a perfect tax haven, Delaware and South Dakota. And this makes sense, since the climate in both these states are so terrible that the only thing that wants to live there is a shell corporation. I thought it might be interesting for your listeners to know a little bit about the leading example here in the United States. Uh, that's the state of South Dakota, a state you don't hear all that much about, uh, sparsely populated in the Midwest of the United States, but they've taken the lead and they took the lead years ago. The story of South Dakota starts in 1981 when they were the first state to say there is no limit, no cap on interest rates. If you have a credit card, the credit card company, the bank ultimately that lends you the money that is being in play every time you use a credit card, it can charge any interest rate it wants. There is no legal limit. Other states didn't do that. Many other states haven't done it to this day, but South Dakota did it. And by the way, that's the reason many of you listening, if you look closely at where the headquarters are of the bank or the credit card company that you deal with, you will discover, perhaps to your surprise, that it's South Dakota. And since very few people live there, you have a mystery which I've just cleared up for you. They're there because they want to be free to charge whatever interest rate they want without a legal cap. And that's why South Dakota got what? Well, it got a lot of banks to open up offices there. They were modest offices, but they had to pay a lawyer to do the paperwork. They had to pay some accountants. They had to rent some space. They brought a few jobs, not many. And South Dakota said, oh, this is great. And a lot of banks will come. And they got the idea. And a few years later, they began to pass one law after another. The most important of these had to do with setting up trusts. Trust is just a legal instrument. And the most famous of these are called settler trusts. A billionaire anywhere in the world arrives or sends a flunky to go to South Dakota and to set up a trust and to deposit millions or billions into this trust. They name a trustee, that's somebody there in South Dakota to manage it all, and a beneficiary, their mother, their son, their daughter. And after a while, they amended the law to allow the benefactor to name himself as the beneficiary, the fellow putting the money in or the woman putting the money in to the account. And the beauty of the law is that no one can know who it is. If you come to the person who put the money in, they say, oh, no, I don't know anything about it. It's not mine. It's in the hands of the trustee. 
The law specifies this. If you ask the trustee or the beneficiary, they say, oh, no, it's not my money. I'm just a trustee. Or it's not my money. I'm just a beneficiary. In the end, not only does nobody have to give anybody any information, but they allow these trusts to exist, get ready for this, in perpetuity. In other words, not only can you put a billion dollars in there, but you can give the billion to your descendants, whoever's there after you die, and there's no inheritance tax, there's no estate tax, nobody knows anything about it, if money moves in and out without anybody having any record that they can expose you for having stolen the money or expose you for having evaded taxes for 50 years or anything else. It's a gamble for the rich. And it's important for an American audience to understand that South Dakota has been doing this for the last 40 years. This is the rest of the show, by the way. We're just going to take a quick... No, I'm kidding. Uh, the, Professor Richard Bulls is awesome. But what he just described is a sociopath's paradise, which is way less cool than a gangster's paradise and significantly less funny than an Amish paradise. You know, at least they give you butter at an Amish paradise, right? A sociopath's paradise, you have to pay for the butter, the bowl, and then there's also a churn tax. Very disappointing. No, none of the Amish really like the churn tax. But these laws that transform states into tax havens where dollar bills outnumber the humans are written and fund funded by conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundations, which was founded by Richard Scaife, the grandson of Andrew Mellon, a prominent banker from my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who was also known as the prophet of trickle down. So, you know, this guy had good ideas. The money held in these offshore accounts and tax havens don't go anywhere. They're not used for anything. They're they're not even using this money to film their eyes wide shut parties on the beach of some island in the South Pacific. It's, this is a total waste. I mean, it's trillions of dollars that could be used to end poverty, starvation, homelessness, and fund public health care, scientific advancement, and get every single teenager on the planet a porn subscription for life. Okay, all this money is just sitting on an island, sipping Mai Tais, contemplating how meaningless existence really is. Yeah, guys, it turns out that money without a true purpose is really, really depressing. Besides this blatantly illegal move, people still want to be billionaires and are okay with the massive benefits they received. And this is because capitalism is a system that tells everyone that they themselves can eventually become billionaires. For starters, vanishingly few people ever become billionaires. In the US, it's around 600 people, or 0.0002% of the population. Perversely, however, the myth of the self-made billionaire tries to trick you into believing that anybody, yes, even you, dear viewer, could one day be just like them. After all, if they can do it, so can you. Look, you have better odds at winning the lottery or getting struck by lighting, lightning, or being anal probed by a very kinky alien. I mean, if you really think about it, the alien likely has to have a sex addiction problem if they're going to use warp speed technology just to come to Earth for butt stuff. It needs to go to a 12-step program is what that alien needs to do. But Ohio State and Cornell universities published their findings on, a, on psychological experiments about how the public views the rich. The more the public sees the ultra-rich through the lens that treats these rich people as isolated individuals, the more comfortable the public tends to be with the enormous concentration of wealth. And this plays into the bullshit American dream that we're force-fed on a daily basis, right? Work hard and you'll be rich. So... I got to ask again, right? Why isn't the single mom working three jobs and 90 hours a week to make sure her kid can afford food and shelter now and college later, not the wealthiest woman in America? I mean, is, is it because 90 hours a week isn't long enough to work? And if you 
answered yes to that, congrats. You're likely a much larger sociopath than Elon Musk and aren't fit to be around organic things as you are a cancer on our very existence. Look, the point is the chances of you, the average American, have, have to becoming a billionaire is slim to none. The system co-ops terms like greed is good and life is hard just to justify exploitation and call these exploiters geniuses. Right? These billionaires shouldn't be applauded or revered. They should be imprisoned on the same island that they hid their money on. Now, the Pandora Papers and the Pandora Papers and the Panama Papers ex expose the use of tax havens to illegally hide money and evade taxes by the ultra wealthy. But there are a few names missing from that list: Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and other American billionaires were missing from the papers. And look, that's not because these guys are upstanding citizens that have given back to the society that built them. No, it's because they've benefit, benefited from the corrupt and very legal tax evasion system in America. In America, the average working class person who makes $70,000 a year pays a tax rate of 14%. And if you make over $600,000 a year, your tax rate is 37%. So if you're a billionaire, you'd pay 37% of your income to taxes, which would be hundreds of millions of dollars per billionaire pumped back into social programs, infrastructure. And yes, yeah, some of it will definitely have to go into whatever is keeping Nancy Pelosi together. It's a lot, of, I feel like it's, it's a lot of clothespins. Is, well, it's a huge clothespins budget for that. The top 25 wealthiest Americans increased their wealth by $401 billion between 2014 and 2018. They paid $13.6 billion in federal taxes over five years. That's a tax rate of 3.4%. And this is the collective tax rate of 25 billionaires. 25 billionaires together pay 10% less in taxes than someone who makes a fraction of a percent of their income. So the question you have to ask yourself with that is, do you believe that this is fair? And I'll go ahead and answer that question for you, assuming that you're a good person that believes in freedom and, you know, all that jazz. Uh, fucking no. No, this is not fair. Why would anybody think this is fair mathematically? It doesn't even make any sense. How could you know regular math and think that this makes any fucking sense? That's crazy. Why would you come up with any other answer if you believe in math? Okay, so how do people like Bezos, Gates, and Musk and... Everybody in that in that one percent category, how do they get away with paying an astronomically low tax rate while average Americans are footing their bill? On an individual level, billionaires pay a maximum of three percent in taxes. Right in two thousand seven, Jeff Bezos paid zero dollars in taxes because he operated at a loss. His despite his income being reported as forty six million dollars, he should have paid approximately seventeen million dollars in taxes that year. The losses come from side projects, deductions from interest payments, and vague categories like, quote, other expenses. Come on. I mean, come on. We all know what other expenses really means, Jeffy. Huh? It's pee porn, isn't it? That's what it is. It's definitely pee porn. We've all seen your, we all know how you treat your employees. We get it. You're into some weird shit. And no one's here to kink shame you, but we are going to shame you for being a piece of shit. So, look, this is what we fund when we shop at Amazon. Everybody that shops at Amazon should feel very dirty, very, very dirty about themselves. One of the ways that billionaires keep their taxes really low is by separating their income from their wealth. Wealth comes from assets like stocks trust bonds or property right this is why billionaires need like a, a summer home and uh, and a winter home and like a home for when the leaves change color and like a beach house and a condo and a fuck pad because you know you don't want to make god angry with all of your other assets but you still want to get your hands on somebody else's assets you know what i'm saying you guys get it you guys got it you guys got it. 
okay, so look, this is how wealth and income works, right? Out of $100 of income, the average American loses about $14 to taxes. The rest of them go to expenses. And if there's anything left, it goes into a savings. For average Americans, their assets in their wealth increases evenly with their taxes. For Jeff Bezos, his tax rate cumulatively over 12 years is 21% of his income. But most of Bezos' wealth is in stocks, and Amazon stock grew, and so his felt wealth is far, far, far greater than his actual taxes. Right? As you can see here, this is, this is the, 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 the difference between his income and his wealth. Right, because Bezos' wealth is tied up in that, right? He doesn't have to pay that much taxes. Americans actually paid one hundred and sixty dollars in taxes for every one hundred dollars of wealth growth, and Bezos pays a dollar nine per hundred dollars of wealth growth. And this is why it's not really a noble gesture when a billionaire says that their take-home income is one dollar for the whole year. I mean. Realistically, this means that they get to cash in on things like EBT, Social Security, tax rebates, and welfare payments, and continue to avoid more taxes. The national income tax was instated in order to pay for the Civil War. Thanks, racists. I mean, look, at this point, no working class person should support any war effort, right? If, I mean, it really, if we would have just learned to talk this out and like, share our feelings, maybe income taxes and taxes in general would be way lower and utilized for things like that actually mattered, like healthcare instead of killing black and brown people across the globe. By 1918, 15% of the American families paid taxes. About 80% of it came from the top 1%. The question of what counts as income came into question in 1916 when Myrtle Macomber received her dividends from Standard Oil, which she received in the form of additional shares. She paid her taxes and then challenged it in courts, claiming that she, had received, she hadn't really received any income but had gotten wealthier. Therefore, the shares were not taxable as direct income. So the Supreme Court ruled that the stocks and bonds and et cetera, et cetera, are not income and therefore cannot be taxed until there is some kind of currency involved. Macklemore's decision was criticized by the father of income tax, Cornell Hull, and he warned about how this could be taken advantage of. He said, quote, people can live upon the value of their company stock without selling it and, of course, paying for it. And this came true in the 70s when antitrust organizations stopped the breaking up of large monopolies. I mean, hell, we still see it today, right? Look at how many pies Jeff Bezos has his little claws into. Amazon sells everything from USB drives to socks to produce. Plus, he owns Whole Foods to control the grocery market. He owns Ring to control the surveillance market and the Washington Post to control the narrative market. He also has his own delivery service, and he gets CIA and FBI contracts regularly. I mean, remember, he started out as an online book vendor and now has infiltrated every single market with ease. At this point, the only thing people don't the only thing that people don't buy from Amazon is is books. So if a large sum of their wealth is tied up in assets, how do these guys remain rich if they can't spend their assets? Simple. They take out loans. Large banks and financial institutions will approve loans for extraordinary sums of money with low interest rates, which remain untaxed, and it shows that these billionaires are operating at a loss. They use these loans to purchase other businesses, properties, and turn them into more untaxed assets or massive refunds. The most absurd example of this is Ethel Mars of the Mars chocolate fame. Yes, that's right, guys. Billionaires have ruined chocolate. Are you still on their side? Hmm? They have corrupted America's national fruit, which I remind you is chocolate. Ethel Mars got the entirety of her horse farm written off her taxes by saying the Milky Way Horse Farm was advertising for her husband's company. She saved 
$288,000 on her taxes in the 1910s. In today's money, that's like a metric fuck ton of dollars. Let me double check that real quick. Yep, it's a metric fuck ton of dollars. But that's not all. You guys like sports balls? Huh? Who doesn't? Ah, it's so many balls and varying sizes and, and shapes. Ah, it's like a geometric wet dream, isn't it? Huh? That's why people watch sports. I know billionaires do love sports balls because owning a sports team is a great way to legally pay less in taxes. Owning a sports team means operating on a loss pretty much all the time. The cost of operating a team is fully deducted from a billionaire's taxes for the duration of owning the team. Since the 40s, player salaries are deducted from the owner's taxes. And this is done by purchasing each player's individual contract before the sale of the company is complete. So even if a team makes a profit, the owner takes a loss based on the total sale price of the whole team. The teams also get subsidies from local governments to build and operate large stadiums and arenas. And this comes from cutting things like health care, teacher salaries, food stamps, and, you know, other things victims of wage theft need to survive. But that's not what we really talk about when it comes to sports, right? Sports are often used as a distraction from large sociopolitical, sociopolitical issues unless it becomes the focal point of how the distraction is contributing to that problem, right? Remember, the Black Lives Matter movement didn't come to become a mainstream topic until football player Colin Kaepernick made it one. Now, in 1993, to prevent new sports dynasties from being owned, Congress did try to limit the benefits of these intangible assets to 15 years. They expanded this to TV and radio deals, but this new expansion left out the sports teams. But fear not, you guys, because I know you guys were like, oh, man, this is crazy. What about those sports teams that give these billionaires super huge tax breaks? They're going to be those billionaires might be become like slightly less billionaires. That's so crazy. Don't worry. Baby boy Bush took care of it when he became chancellor and overlord of the American military. In 2004, he undid the 15-year limit and included sports teams in the expanded intangible benefits definition. Now, did Bush do this because he's a huge believer in the merits of athletics for both physical and mental health? Or, or, or perhaps he's just a really big fan of camaraderie and sportsmanship. Uh, no, uh, that's crazy. Uh, for that to be true, you would need like a functioning brain and a heart and, you know, like a soul, all of which Bush sold to Halliburton when Cheney became vice overlord. No, he did it because the MLB lobby pressured him to, and he owned the Texas Rangers at that time. With this, owning a sports team meant that you can add the cost of TV ads, radio and TV contracts, along with player salaries, and basically reduce your taxes by 90%. But the IRS is fine with this because they say that depreciating assets are necessary to write off for a growing business. But if that was the case, then a self-employed individual like myself can make the case that anything that keeps me alive is a vehicle for making revenue for my solo enterprise. Every meal I eat, 100% of the rent I pay, gas I spend in my car, the money I spend on utilities would all be deducted from my taxes. But unfortunately, that is not the case when it comes to the average working class person. And all this really proves is that there are two different economies and two sets of laws in our society. And there's a big hypocrisy under one of the most fundamental rules of capitalism here. If the idea of a business within capitalism is to gain more and more wealth each quarter, and we agree that sports teams are operating on at a loss pretty consistently, then what is the logical reason for owning a sports team? There isn't one, unless you can get an even bigger tax break by owning one at a loss. But when you bring this up to a billionaire, they're not big fans of it. You know, they respond the same way that 1940s Cleveland Browns owner Bill Veek responded. He said, quote, look, we play the Star Spangled Banner before each game. 
You want us to pay income taxes too? What? Yeah, fucking yeah, yeah, we do. I, well, what does playing a racist and violent song have to do with a game that exploits black athletes? Okay, no, wait, I hear it. I heard it. I heard it as I was saying it. Yep. I mean, none of these would be truly American sports without racism being at its core, right? Still, a quote, patriotic song doesn't actually help your country or its citizens. Hence, these owners are making your favorite games, sports games, highly unpatriotic. But wait, there's more. Now, when an owner of a sports team dies, they don't have to pay taxes on the depreciated amount of the team. They can just give the whole thing to their heirs, and the cycle begins anew. This is called the circle of fucking your life. Yeah, Sports teams are a great way to escape the estate tax, which has been a thorn in the side of the ultra-rich for a very long time. The estate tax get paid when a rich person dies and the sum of their wealth goes uh, wealth and income gets taxed at about 40%. And the only way to evade these taxes is to give your son or daughter an inheritance while the billionaire is still alive. Or when that doesn't work, then they leave it for their grandkids. So procreation is incredibly important, not because of love or wanting to carry on your family name or any of that bullshit. No, but for business reasons. Real American reasons, right? We need to figure out who's going to carry on this hoarded wealth. Look, every capitalist, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, harps on the poor having a lot of kids as a way to get more in welfare payments and save money on taxes, right? Yet we have not heard a peep from these same people when the rich are literally doing the exact same thing. They wrote it into law that they evade taxes by giving it to their heirs. The rich are the only ones having anchor babies in America. Okay, And the anchor babies are drowning the working class. Now, imagine telling a kid that they were born to help grandma and grandpa avoid taxes and keep the average working class struggling nonstop. You know, the options for that kid to continue, you know, is to either continue being a sociopath like his ancestors because... They're all, all they are is just a walking pile of cash or revolt against the system that their grandparents set up to ensure the lives of billions of other people are bettered. Or, yes, they could become like a really warped version of Batman who's like super dead on the inside and is very okay with beating up poor people. That's an option, too. That's an option, too. I feel like I just pitched the next Zack Snyder Batman reboot. Fuck. Uh, Look, regardless, capitalism is breeding a new generation of trauma and mental illness. Andrew Mellon is the architect of how people can hide their assets and escape paying taxes even at their demise. Mellon was President Harding's Treasury Secretary and, again, is called the prophet of trickle-down, so you know he was drowning in fiscally responsible and wildly racist pussy. You know how we do. You know how we do. Look, as the head of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, he ordered them to find 10 loopholes that the rich can use. He later confesses to using five of them. I, 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 I suppose we should adorn him for not using all 10? Way to go, Andy. Way, way to show some restraint, buddy. Okay, maybe this fact will convince you that we shouldn't be building statues of Cretans like him or worshipping these people like noble gods. The Mellon family believed the rich had to pay high taxes because of black people and voting rights. Yeah, it wouldn't really be a true American story if it wasn't blatantly racist, just for kicks. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to raise the taxes on the super wealthy to 94%, which would have included a raise to the estate tax, Mellon responded by saying, quote, the social necessity for breaking up large fortunes in this country does not exist. He followed that up by saying, I am this country. Yeah, and then he became capitalism itself, you guys. Okay, some say, some say, you can hear him disparaging the poor every time someone takes out cash at the ATM. Just little whispers, just little whispers. He also called the estate tax 
economic suicide, which only goes to show that the that mental health concerns are real when it comes to, it comes to the economy, right? When the economy faces trauma, everybody's like, oh my God, we should really care about people's mental health, right? When the Wall Street algorithm no longer sees the value of its own life and wants to kill itself, the billionaires are empathetic to talk about things like suicide awareness and depression. Oh, the silent killers. But as he was becoming more of a walking ego flesh bag, the Great Depression occurred in part thanks to the tax cuts that Mellon awarded his rich pals. Now, Mellon's estate wound up paying about $668 million in taxes, but that was a drop in the bucket considering most of his assets had been parsed out to his kids. And Mellon's not the only one that's gone after the estate tax. The first black billionaire, Robert Johnson, owner of Black Entertainment Television Network, claimed that eradicating the estate tax would shrink the income divide between black and white Americans. Now, when asked to explain, explain this in intimate detail, he threw down a smoke bomb and in his place was Cedric the Entertainer. Every, everybody was confused, including Cedric. He didn't know how he got there. It was, very, it was a terrifying moment for all of us involved. I don't understand how that happened. But look, this is incredibly false, considering only 59 out of the 38 million black people that live in America have to pay estate taxes. So I guess it would shrink the gap between a few white billionaires and the even fewer black billionaires. In 2001, farmers were the scapegoats of eradicating the estate tax. Right? George Bush claimed that the estate taxes were slashed to save farmers from losing their farms. And look, this was a huge far problem because a grand total of zero farmers had lost their farms to the estate tax. Fucking zero. The cruel fact about all this is that this is all legal. If you talk to any billionaire about their taxes, they usually respond by saying, they're paying all the taxes they owe. And it's true. The problem isn't just billionaires. It's the fact that our system is bought and sold. If you're going to have a government run by capitalism, all you'll see is rampant inequalities masquerading as the greatest democracy on earth. Now, every single billionaire has benefited greatly by the crooked and corrupt legal tax system that allows things like trusts, sports teams, horse farms, and other assets, including their own children, to evade their taxes. Or they have offshore accounts. But because we live in a capitalist system where money defines your intelligence and talent, we still believe that billionaires are good people. Or at least some of them are. Uh, someone like Elon Musk is spending more of their time trolling on Twitter than they are doing whatever the fuck Elon Musk does, you know, but for example, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett is a billionaire who has repeatedly said that his class should pay more in taxes, right? Buffett has been pushing for Congress to increase the income tax rate for billionaires for years. In fact, in 2011, President Obama was going to pass Buffett's law, which would have increased the income tax rate for the rich. Seems nice, right? Now, I want to make this very clear. This is very different from Buffet's Law, uh, which would make us all eat at least one of our meals as a buffet, which seems intrusive and very unhealthy. And it's staggeringly different than Buffy's Law, which states, fuck Angel. Seems aggressive, but if you know Buffy, kind of romantic too, you know, kind of, kind of nice. The only problem with this is that it would, it would have still allowed these billionaires to hide their wealth in untaxed assets and claim things like entire sports teams as depreciating assets. And it completely ignores what to do about tax havens like the Caribbean and South Dakota. Buffett has also come out and said that he wants to ensure that he pays as much of his estate tax as possible, but still leaving an inheritance behind for his kids and grandkids. The way he puts it is that he wants them to leave he, he wants to leave them with enough to do anything they'd like, but not so much that they get entitled and lazy. This is what we like to call the Goldilocks zone of universal basic income. 
Warren Buffett's plan for his kid ap- kids after he dies is basically to set them up with a personal trust fund UBI. And this is a very blatant example of socialism for the rich. He's also an he's a, uh, immensely philanthropic billionaire. I write these big words that I can't say. <laughs> but he wants to ensure that when he dies, a large portion of his wealth goes to charitable causes that he believes in. Now, I'm sure we can go into the specifics of these charities and the issues with the charitable industrial complex and the nonprofit world, but that's not the point I want to make here. It's a whole different hour and a half show, right? Those are problems, but the issue I have with Buffett's methodology is that he's still using these philanthropic endeavors to pay less in taxes. The organizations have loopholes for the extremely rich and wealthy, right? People like Buffett and even Twitter's Jack Dorsey set up a charity company to put their money into and base that organization in tax haven states like South Dakota and Delaware. So if someone like Warren Buffett really wanted to show this system why taxing billionaires would be beneficial to Americans, then he should just give the middle finger to the system by directly donating to grassroots efforts that have a direct impact on people's lives rather than this weird roundabout philanthropy. If Warren Buffett took the money, he, he knows that he should be paying in taxes and gave it away without a proxy charity to projects that vastly improved the lives of the American people. He'd prove how and why taxing the rich and erasing these leap loopholes would be highly beneficial to America, freedom and democracy. Think of how how much good someone like Warren Buffett could do if he donated even $1 million to a mutual aid organization in every single state. He would be out $50 million, but he would still have a metric fuck ton of dollars left. Let me double check that. Yeah, it's a metric fuck ton of dollars. Yeah, mutual aids across the country have done more good for the American people by feeding, clothing, and taking care of them than the American government or any billionaire ever has. But this doesn't prove, this doesn't provide any sort of massive tax benefit. So there's no incentive for billionaires like Buffett to do so. Then you have CEOs like Dan Price, who cut their own personal salary to ensure that every employee's starting salary was $70,000 back in 2018. Now, conservatives shouted that this would mean it was the end of his company, but it was quite the opposite. The morale rose, the company made more money, and it increased its client base, and now employees are making over $100,000 a year. And as nice as it is to see charitable and more understanding rich folks, I always see stories like this with a little bit of skepticism. Not only for the reasons that I've already listed, but also because billionaires like E.W. Scripps existed. Scripps was a a newspaper tycoon who sold his paper for a penny to help the working class stay informed. He would go after the billionaire class of his time and take them down several pegs. I also understand that the term tycoon isn't really used in our vernacular these days. You know, unless you're referring to the kids who got way into, you know, like, roller coaster tycoon and they made like a crown of cheetos and you know, spent most of their time decreeing things about corn dogs this happened to a friend of mine i'm speaking about a friend of mine but scripps went after the, the people trying to slash the estate tax right he feared his kids would become quote unutterable snobs if they inherited all his wealth Here's how he viewed the class system. He said, quote, I don't I didn't count myself as a friend of the poor. I counted myself as the antagonist of the foolish members of my own class. He presented himself as a self-hating billionaire. Scripps wanted to tax the rich at a higher rate in order to pay for World War One. Right. Woodrow Wilson did pass an estate tax of 10 percent, which quickly rose to 40 percent in two years, thanks to the good old war effort. All other tycoons, roller coaster or otherwise, wanted to reduce their taxes and just have us poors pay foot the bill. And maybe they started realizing that, you know, paying for war is not great. But then they just realized they could control every inch of American democracy to ensure that they never have to be the ones that ever pay for the wars uh, to steal the resources that don't belong to them. So good for them. 
Now, Scripps was writing stories about how this royal class would evade their taxes and what tricks they used to stay tax-free. But after World War I, Scripps realized that his efforts were starting to screw him out of his own personal wealth. So he went to President Harding and convinced him to reduce taxes on the rich and confess that he used the same tricks he criticized others of avoiding to pay taxes. As much as he chastised his fellow oligarchs for using trust to evade uh, the estate tax, that's exactly what he was doing. He also gave his female heirs one half of what he gave his male heirs. What a stand-up guy. Now, take away from the script story here is that he wasn't fighting for us. He was fighting against other billionaires for his own personal gain. He was always fighting for himself, despite what he printed in his newspapers. This makes me skeptical of rich people like Warren Buffett and Dan Price, especially when they act philanthropically. Are they actually fighting for us or just against other billionaires? And what incentives are they getting in the back end for screwing other billionaires? And, and yes, you're right. This does sound exactly like the game of Monopoly because that's exactly how this economy is set up. It's set up like a board game, except, you know, no one ever passes go and, and most people are in prison and the railroads are like always on fire. Now, the silver lining from the script story is that he did show how good journalism can expose the corrupt rot of our system and drive positive change. But this kind of investigative journalism is proving to become dangerous. Billionaires tend to get very defensive when it comes to questions about their wealth and earnings. When, they, when asked if they believe it's fair that they paid little to no taxes, they get angry and basically say, yeah, they do believe it's fair. Some billionaires actually claim publishing tax inf information is a violation of privacy. But then how do we know they paid what they actually owed based on like real math, right? Right now, American math is just warped and mutated in an experimental version of math where percentages don't mean what they used to anymore. You know, we're supposed to take these math ma manipulating malcontents on their word. Look, a billionaire's word is worth as much as the minimum wage they peddle. In a lot of instances, journalists that investigate these type of stories are threatened with legal action. And most of these investigative journalists are funded by their readers and don't have large corporations backing their stories. So they can't afford a lawyer to fight back against a billionaire who has a legal team the size of the sports team that they own. I'm sure the lawyers are considered a depreciating asset too. But this practice of billionaires attacking journalists is as old as, well, old money. In 1924, the Boston Globe published what the, what the richest men in America paid in taxes. The rich lost their minds and attacked the papers. Progressive presidential candidate Robert Fightin' Bob LaFollette said taxes are public information and should be available to the public. He added, quote, dishonesty and crime thrive in the dark. Now, this explains why the rich today are scurrying off to space. It's the darkest place they know, and thus, they can avoid all the taxes and live on wealth by buying the very concept of the universe itself. The Boston Globe and any other paper that published the richest tax information were attacked by large corporate newspapers like the New York Times. Eventually, the Department of Justice gets involved and brings up charges on the papers that publish this information. This opens a court case, but both the lower courts and the Supreme Court sided with the papers, at which point Congress wrote a law restricting the investigation on, of taxes on the rich. But don't worry, you guys. OK, they will be auditing the ever living shit out of the poor, you know. So like justice is a word we've all kind of heard of. So what the hell can we do to bring down these financial juggernauts 
right? Well, Congress has a plan to increase the top tier income tax to 40%. This will prove to be just as effective as the time 400 lawmakers decided to make a video to Jeff Bezos saying, hey, uh, be nice, okay? You're not, you're not being nice right now, and, and we don't like that. So, so we're just going to give you puppy eyes and maybe like a really long hug, uh, and, and, that, and that maybe then you'll think about being, being nice. Look, if you're going to use legislation to drive positive change for the most amount of people, then fucking do that, right? Reverse the law that separates assets from income so that rich people can't hide behind their stocks, bonds, sports teams, and trusts. And then tax them at like 90%, similar to what FDR and Eisenhower did. And yes, this will expose how bought and sold the American election system is, which then further reduces the control of capitalism on democracy, which is objectively a good thing if you believe in like, you know, democracy. And if the rich protest this decision, which I assume that they will, will say, fine, it's okay, you can keep things as they are, but we now take your genitals. So no more spawning and expanding the corporate oligarchy through lineage, right? If you're going to have to do that, you're going to have to find like a sociopath to groom, which is just going to be a PR nightmare because that kid is probably going to kill like a lot of animals, so many animals. It's going to be real bad. And then your stock prices are going to plummet. But, and, then, and then at that point, you'll, you'll probably join the ranks of the poor. And, and at that point, you get to have your genitals back. But... You won't be able to afford the laser surgery to reattach it in place. And that's called the circle of fucking their lives. So which one of these lesser of two evils would the billionaires like to go with? I'll wait till we make our decision. Look, if that's too extreme, uh, then perhaps the millionaire surtax will be more up to speed. This taxes both, uh, both assets and income of anyone making more than $2 million a year. And if you guffawed at that statement, then you have way too much money and just want to hoard it all and confirm your own sociopathy. Look, a $2 million salary is still astronomical. It's enough money that you don't have to worry about money because of its absurd abundance. 76% of independents and moderates and 57% of Trumpers plus 53% of Republicans are for this tax. All that's getting in the way is the political will of politicians who have their official address listed as the pockets of the rich corporate oligarchs. Another hurdle to get over is the love affair a majority of people have with billionaires. And again, that goes back to looking at them as individually wealthy by virtue of hard work and bootstrap pulling. So Oxfam, a tax organization, has a very easy way to dissuade people of that myth. They want to set up a public registry of banks, trusts, shell corporations, assets, and track revenue and finances. They also want to enact a global blacklist of tax havens. Right. Looks like Delaware and South Dakota have to figure out a different way to get people and businesses to come there. Oxfam also wants to increase the corporate tax to 25 percent. And before someone screams inflation, remember that prices are already inflated and continue to become even more inflated without taxing the rich. That means that inflation is created by the rich to stay rich and has nothing to do with their tax rate or our minimum wage. Solutions like this redistribute the enormous wealth that already exists to things we need. Now, we are seeing a shift in the consciousness of the working class. Since the pandemic that enriched the already rich started, we've seen an exponential rise in strikes and labor action. It's more possible than ever to push politicians to start taxing and redistributing that hoarded wealth back to the people Look, we shamed average people for that hoarded toilet paper in the beginning of the pandemic. So why aren't we shaming billionaires for hoarding wealth the way they are for centuries? Billionaires are cowards, unwilling to act for the public good because it means that they won't be richer than God anymore. 
they speak and act out of fear of not being able to send an astro astrological dick pic with a rocket. No one should want to be a billionaire, especially if you believe in de democracy. Being a billionaire is undemocratic. Democracy is built on the idea that it's equality for everyone. Avoiding taxes, amassing obscene levels of wealth, and hoarding it helps no one except those cowardly billionaires. The end. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of Forkful of Noodles. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please give it a big old thumbs up. Uh, a retweet or, and, and share this out with as many people as you can. Share it with a friend, share it with an enemy, share it with anybody that you think would find some kind of value from this episode. Uh, the, the focus of this channel is and always will continue to be a, a historical and psychological lens on various sociopolitical topics, and I will do my best to uh, break them down and and uh, add add some comedic flavor so we can <laughs> we can all enjoy. Uh, the the depressing information that that uh, uh, that we all kind of have to contend with and hopefully drive positive change in our lives. So if you enjoyed that, if you if that that is uh, a goal that you enjoy, please, please do hit the like button. Please do make sure that you're subscribed to my channels uh, and please do share this out with as many people as you can. Uh, and if you want to become a sustaining member, make a one time donation. Um, come to a virtual show, come to a in-person live show and want to know when I'm coming to a city near you, you can do so directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I post videos on this channel uh, every Monday, every Thursday, and then infrequently throughout the weeks as well. Uh, so please do make sure you're subscribed. Please do make sure you're on the email list to get uh, new information from me and, and just a list of all the videos I've produced throughout the week. Uh, so uh, that, again, all of that is available directly on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. Uh, but till then, thank you guys for tuning in. Be good to yourselves. Be good to each other. And we'll see you on the road. Bye, guys.